We have to create the conditions where we are not so blind to the interconnectedness. There is a hypercausality that's now vividly in our face in relation to the health of our planet and the decline of it. I realized why His Holiness said that compassion is the radicalism of our time. It is truly the most uh, upstream frame of reference, attitude, uh, embodied experience that is uh, essential for the well-being of all species and also for coming generations. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. We are back with season four of the show, and I'm so happy to be able to kick things off with today's guest, Roshi Joan Halifax. Roshi Joan is a renowned Zen Buddhist teacher and author, a pioneer in the field of end of life care, and founder and abbot of the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She's been an advocate for engaged Buddhism, social activism, and compassion in response to today's crises. And as we'll hear, she was also instrumental in developing the dialogue between science and Buddhism. In our conversation, Roshi shares how she worked with Francisco Varela to develop the first dialogues with the Dalai Lama and scientists. And then we discuss what is meant by the term inactive mind, which was a central theme in Varela's philosophy. This gets us into the idea that compassion is emergent and highly dependent on context. And we talk about what factors can be trained that set the stage for compassion to arise. We get into the importance of embodiment in the training of healthcare providers and the concept of non-referential compassion. Tapping into Roshi's experience in social activism, we discuss the relevance of interdependence and compassion in addressing climate change. And Roshi reflects on her many decades of work with dying people, current research on psychedelics, and the future of contemplative science. As always, of course, you can find lots more from Roshi in the show notes, including a presentation from last year's Summer Research Institute on integrity and moral suffering in relation to the climate catastrophe and health. I also highly recommend checking out the many wonderful talks available on Upaya Zen Center's podcast, also linked in the show notes. It's always a pleasure to speak with Roshi Joan, I feel like her work and her wisdom is such a unique blend of anthropology, philosophy, cognitive science, social activism, healthcare, and of course, Buddhism. I hope this conversation sheds new light for you, maybe offering a different way to think about how compassion shows up in your life. I'm so happy to share with you Roshi Joan Halifax. Well, I'm joined today by Roshi Joan Halifax. Roshi Joan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm grateful to be here. So there's so many things that I'm looking forward to talking with you about. Maybe we can just start in the beginning. I'd love to hear some of your personal story and how you came to do the work that you do. And of course, your long history um, with Mind and Life and Francisco Vera. So wherever you want to start with that. Well, that's too long a story for what we're doing today. <laughs> Simply, I feel a lot of gratitude for uh, what's happening in the field of contemplative neuroscience today, the um, great diversity of perspectives. And I feel like I've been a small part of that. Um, Francisco and I were both fellows in the Lindisfarne Association, and this was in the 1970s. Also, uh, our good friend, Evan Thompson, was right. part of that group. And Bill Thompson, Ev's father, um, you know, was a visionary who uh, was also a historian and had a prophetic voice. And so he brought together many individuals involved in the humanities, science, uh, social engagement, the environment, and so forth, plus philosophers and um, religious types. And so it was in that context that uh, I had the privilege of meeting Francisco. And then we met again in Cadiz, Spain in uh, 1981. And needless to say, very much in the spirit of Lindisfarne, our conversation turned toward Dharma and science. And uh, shortly after that meeting, 
we were both at a meeting in Stanford uh, on order and disorder where the economist Kenneth Arrow, a chemist Ilya Prigogin, and of course Cisco presented. Um, and it was basically about complex adaptive systems. And it was in the context of that meeting, which was also in 81, that this uh, kind of um, really radical uh, exchange between Francisco and me moved to me saying at one point, we should do this, you know, but with His Holiness. And um, we both got very excited uh, about that possibility of having an interdisciplinary dialogue with His Holiness present, um, with him also offering his views, his perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so that conversation went on actually for several years. And then in uh, 1983, um, I had had uh, eye surgery and my eyes uh, had to have radiation and they hadn't mm. fractionated the dosage. Oh. So as a result, my eyes were burned and Francisco oh happened to be in the States and we were really close friends and he came to see me. And about this time I was invited by a faculty person at the University of California, Santa Barbara to be in a small science meeting with His Holiness. And um, I had said yes, of course, but after this medical accident, I felt quite inhibited about going to the meeting. Yeah, so could you see? No, I couldn't. I was in eye bandages. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So you were blind, basically. Yeah, I was. Wow. And, you know, Francisco and I talked about it, and I, I, one of the things that we were looking at is if His Holiness, uh, if the opportunity presents itself, would I suggest this this idea? And so Cisco really pushed me to go to the meeting, and I went, and it was a tiny meeting. And at the end of it, His Holiness invited me to have a private audience with him Wow! in the next morning at 7 a.m. And so I went for that private audience, and um, he was so kind, so wonderful. Did you, you already had some relationship with him? At that no, time? I'd never met him before. Oh, my goodness. I know. He just invited you from the meeting. Yeah. Well, I, I, I probably looked pretty pitiful, if you know what I'm saying, <laughs> or very brave, eyes. one or the other. Both, <laughs> you know? I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I didn't know how I looked. But anyway, uh, there I was. And in the course of our interaction, I talked about Francisco and about this idea. And he loved mm. it. He, mm. he was just completely lit up about it. And I, you know, I think His Holiness has always been a, a scientist at heart. Yeah. Um, you know, he teaches like one, and um, he views things like one. And so, not so long after that, there was another meeting in Alpaca, Austria, and Cisco and His Holiness were in the same space. And Cisco, you know, got together with His Holiness, and um, His Holiness just loved the idea. Yeah. So what, what was the idea specifically that, that you put forward? Well, that we would have an interdisciplinary meeting around certain uh, content related to neuroscience and contemplative experience, and that it would include Western philosophers in addition to neuroscientists mm -hmm. and other people in the humanities and even uh, people who were contemplatives in other traditions. And of course, philosophers, essential. <laughs> yeah. Was it mainly at that time thinking about um, consciousness, uh, the, kind of the nature of mind? Or? You know, I think really um, His Holiness, of course, is uh, so interested in consciousness, but what he was really interested in had to do with neural mapping, where this stuff mm -hmm. shows up in the brain. So it was pretty neurocentric, his, his uh -huh. interests in a way. Because here you'd have neuroscientists, people who were actually measuring uh, activity in the brain in relation to various stimuli. And so there he was, you know, it, it brought a lot of things together. His kind of scientific view, um, consciousness, the nature of mind, uh, philosophy, uh, both Eastern and Western philosophy. And then, you know, uh, this really radical uh, exploration of so-called phenomenology, that is first-person experience. Mm. So it was a very, I mean, it really fit for both Francisco, who was okay. He was a neuroscientist. 
he was a Buddhist, so he was a contemplative, and he was a philosopher, so he was everybody <laughs> in a certain <laughs> way. He covered the field. He just got backup help from various renowned people <laughs> in the, later in the meetings. <laughs> well, you brought you also brought together a lot of different fields too, right? Like you're trained as an anthropologist originally, and then at that time you had already been involved in Buddhism, it sounds like. Yeah, I've, I've been an, uh, a practitioner since 1965. Okay. But anyway, you know, uh, back to uh, Cisco and Mind and Life. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't really have uh, a personal connection with His Holiness. And uh, it was in 85, an associate of mine in uh, San Francisco said, you know, there are these two businessmen who are interested in doing some kind of a meeting around physics uh, with His Holiness. And, you know, we heard about what you and Francisco uh, were talking about. Uh -huh. I think you all should meet. And so... Uh, what was really interesting was Adam and Michael Saltman, Adam Engel and Michael Saltman came down to Ojai and we sat under this big oak tree and uh, began this exploration. And uh, Adam said, you know, I'm in, I'll do anything to help make this happen. Mm. And, you know, such an endeavor uh, would take a businessman in the sense that, you know, it's a certain kind of persistence, organizational ability uh, refusal to say no, and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> so, you know, Michael eventually dropped out of the picture. But uh, Adam and uh, Francisco, and I also, uh, as a friend and advisor in the early years, um, really uh, lit up as yeah. this uh, possibility began to unfold into a reality. So, I, you know, a lot of good things have come out of it. Uh, it's been, you know, the first meeting was in 87. I was right. fortunate to be able to uh, present in 1992 uh, in Dharamsala. And um, it's just been, you know, very, I think, useful uh, for this exploration of, uh, of mind. You know, Francisco always saw things not just as uh, from a neurocentric perspective, he always saw things also as context dependent. And out mm -hmm. of this, he uh, developed the uh, inactive view, which I think is very important uh, at this time. You know, as Evan Thompson, uh, Ezekiel de Paolo, Hannah de Jaeger, and other wonderful philosophers and scientists are looking at the very fact that we are shaped by our environment and we shape our environment. We cannot yeah. separate ourselves from the context of our lived experience. So this work came really primarily out of Francisco and, and Eleanor Roche and Evan um, were part of that uh, thinking process. Yeah, it's, it's so wonderful to hear that history and your major role in it too. I'm wondering, um, you spoke a little bit about the inactive view, um, which has become, I think, really central too in, in contemplative science that's has evolved. And is that how you would say now, um, I guess I'm wondering from all your experiences with these engagement with scientists and philosophers and your deep knowledge of Buddhism, how you've come to view the mind. You know, it reminds me of something I witnessed many, many years ago. This was in the 1970s, where my uh, husband, Stanislav Groff, and I uh, were in a small meeting with uh, Jonas Salk and Gregory Bateson. Mind you, I was an anthropologist, also married to a psychiatrist who was working with LSD as an adjunct to psychotherapy, and I was uh, his partner in that. Um, so we brought, you know, a kind of interesting perspective into this question, but also our disciplines, Groff's and mine, anthropology, psychology, psychiatry, um, you know, brought also views in that uh, we're very influenced by our own perspective. And uh, we watched this interaction between Gregory Bateson and Jonas Salk with a quite, uh, well, for me, it just was went right into my marrow, and it affirmed mm. something that I, as an anthropologist looking at patterns of culture, 
for individual cultures, but also cross-culturally, I knew to be the case intuitively, but you know, to have it put this way by Bateson blew my mind. And this was the interaction. So Gregory and Jonas Salk are sitting in chairs slightly opposite from each other, but you know, the chairs uh, uh, rotated at about, you know, maybe a 30 degree angle, so they weren't in direct confrontation. And Bateson, who hardly ever wore socks, I just remember looking at his ankles with fascination. <laughs> Those old <laughs> ankles. <laughs> and uh, his uh, hulking physique, you know, he's very tall and kind of mm. hunched over with thought. You know, his brain was so big, it was like a, <laughs> you know, a dead weight on him. And, you know, he was always in this mode of inquiry. And Jonas, who was very slight in frame and uh, a wiry being, and uh, had in his later years um, become much more philosophical and reflective. But they had kind of opposite energy. And I, I remember mm. feeling that in my body. Mm. <laughs> and uh, Bateson had a uh, very... Uh, interesting approach to uh, these kinds of interactions, you know, interactions with high-ranking people, so to speak. Um, he would bait them. So I always <laughs> smiled. His, his name was somehow right. appropriate, but spelled a little differently. <laughs> but he would um, ask questions that um, were apparently very stupid and naive, <laughs> but actually uh, the quote's right answer would reveal a whole landscape. Hmm. And most people gave the obvious and the stupid answer. And in this case, so did Jonas. So Bateson leaned over and under his hooded lids, his eyes kind of caught Jonas's and he asked Jonas, where is the mind? And Jonas kind of sat up like, what a stupid question and pointed to his temples, mm -hmm. i.e. to his brain. And Bateson made a kind of, it's like a barely perceptible guffaw. Mm -hmm. And he took his long bony finger, much in the same gesture uh, that Jonas had engaged in, but pointed it between him and Jonas. Mm. And I could see Jonas, who was a good friend of mine. It, it was like he was startled because yeah. he saw what Bateson saw so clearly. And I think, though Francisco was not at that meeting, um, what we're beginning to understand is that a little bit of a rush of blood in a neural system says there's activity, but there's a whole world. Mm that is actually responding to us in the, you know, in the similar way to how our brains are responding to the world and to our experience of it. Mm. And so, you know, out of this, the inactive you has influenced many of us. And recently uh, I, I shared um, uh, about uh, an, an active perspective on compassion and I built that talk, which I did for Mind and Life Europe, uh, out of a line from uh, a piece that Cisco uh, wrote many years ago on compassion, which is also an area that I've been uh, deeply engaged yeah. with in doing this heuristic map of compassion, training people in compassion and so on. And anyway, this line really caught me. It says, this is Francisco. It should not be surprising that one of the main characteristics of spontaneous compassion, which is not a characteristic of volitional action based on habitual patterns, is that it follows no rules. Mm. And when I read that, I was like, yes, of course. <laughs> it's so very Francisco, but it's to understand, and this is deeply in relation to how compassion is trained. And in a way, it's kind of futile to go right to compassion. 
And in my work at the Library of Congress in DC, where I was developing a heuristic map of compassion, it was so clear to me that compassion is actually made of non-compassion elements. Hmm. And that uh, the training had to do with actually uh, identifying those non-compassion elements and strengthening those elements. Because compassion is this spontaneous process. You cannot make compassion happen, per se. It's, mm. You cannot prescribe it. You can only go upstream to those facets uh, of compassion to create the conditions where compassion can be primed. And compassion is fundamentally a, a sense-making process that is about mutuality, context sensitivity, uh, adaptivity, and so forth. So uh, you can see that my own work has been deeply influenced by the inactive perspective from, from just sharing Francisco's view of compassion being non-volitional and as well you can't prescribe it. Yeah. It is emergent. But in training, you can create the conditions of sensitivity that uh, prime this process that we call compassion, which is inactive, completely context dependent. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that, the creating the conditions and kind of how can we prime the facets that lead to compassion? Well, I, actually, I have too much to say about it. And our, our time is just trotting along. But yeah. anyway, so, you know, um, what was clear to me is that compassion is composed of non-compassion elements. And here are some of the things that um, are trainable, which uh, make compassion possible. And the first one is something you're really familiar with, and that's attention. Hmm. Um, if your attention is divided dispersed or distracted. The quality of balance required to be in the presence of suffering or even to sense the general suffering of the world, um, it's not possible mm. because you're ungrounded. You don't have the capacity both to focus and also to include the immediate and the wider context including not just the physical or social context, but also the view. Hmm. So attentional balance is essential. And of course, as you know, I've worked with healthcare workers since you know many decades, since 1970, actually. So that's 51 years. And the way most healthcare workers are trained, whether they're doctors or nurses, chaplains, is um, to ignore, for example, their own uh, physical experience. But their attentional field is constantly being fragmented by uh, how they're trained and the context of their service. You know, if you just think about the healthcare field, but how about yeah. all the rest of us? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, with our devices and so called multitasking, which can't really, you know, happen. And right. So attention is, is one. And whether it's focused attention, it's, you know, in the beginning to maintain concentration, and then panoramic, what's been called open presence, I think this is really critical uh, for the training of clinicians, educators, politicians, human rights workers, environmentalists, et cetera. Mm. And then another aspect has to do with the cultivation of pro-social qualities. And, you know, there's so uh, uh, many approaches in Buddhism and in other traditions, and also just the basic uh, perspectives of civility in society, you know, what it is to be a good person, how to be a good person, and so forth. And so from the Buddhist perspective, you know, it's everything from the Brahma Viharas practicing, you know, the four wonderful boundless abodes, or in Lozhong, uh, the seven point mind training, or whether it is this experience of Tonglin exchanging self with other as well, uh, 
two different uh, sort of branches of the same bodhicitta practice. So there's, you know, there's various wonderful approaches um, in Buddhism to cultivate that sense of prosociality. And also we see in the values of our culture, both the positive effects of prosociality, so it's good to practice it. And it's interesting, I was saying to, I met with a student this morning who um, came from a very sort of busy urban life and is now in the Upaya community. And we were exploring how the experience of actually living in a, a small social network, such as one would in a practice center like our center, there's much higher accountability for prosociality than in our small nuclear family systems or even our individual lives. Mm. So, you know, but training in that, and which is a strong ethical component. And then uh, insight is, a, you know, another quality and I have lots to say about that, but not to take up the whole podcast with this <laughs> perspective. And then embodiment, so important, you know, is that uh, even if we can't do something, we actually have the impulse to engage. So our premotor cortex is, you know, sort of lit up, but we, you know, we want to be uh, engaged in an action that uh, benefits another or others. This last point on embodiment, I feel like it's another thread that is really um, runs through so much of what we're learning from contemplative science these days and the essential role of the body in, um, in mind, of course, and in transformation and healing. And Wendy, the body in context, the mm -hmm. body in its situatedness. Yes. The body is in response too, through, you know, all of our uh, senses, but even on a most subtle level to the very experience of our surrounds. Yeah, exactly. It really, um, it just shines such a light on interdependence, right? Like there's, it's impossible to separate any of the elements of um, everything that's going on around us. So, but let me make another point here that's more contemporary. And that is that from the, really the time of the Buddha up into, you know, more uh, our recent time, um, what is clear to us is that when one is training in these subtle mind states, uh, doing it uh, on the subway <laughs> or uh, in the busy streets of New York is not the best place to begin. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, we go to places like Upaya or IMS or Spirit Rock, um, which have a contemplative atmosphere, and we train in those contexts. At the time of the Buddha, the recommendation is this, you know, forest practice. For me, it's been mountain practice, using the natural world as a way to um, reduce the psychosocial distractions of civilization. <laughs> and to be able to uh, not have the nervous system mediating uh, these more uh, complex and even disruptive and anti-physical uh, uh, inputs that we experience in our built environments. Yeah, it's so essential and it's hard, I think, for so many people to find that kind of a quiet, secluded space these days, whether even it's just a psychological space or physical space too, is equally important. Um, is there anything else to say uh, that's coming to mind for you about the role of the body and how we can use that in practice and in generating, um, well, I was going to say generating compassion, but generating the um, prerequisites for compassion? I think there's a very interesting uh, literature on the relationship between uh, interoceptivity, that is our capacity to sense into our somatic, particularly our visceral experience, 
and um, where that shows up in the brain and where uh, empathy shows up in the brain. So I often use the uh, image, I, I referred to it earlier in our conversation, of the uh, way that um, many healthcare workers are trained is that their own relationship with the body is disrupted by the structure of the training. Mm. So eating, sleeping, bathroom needs, et cetera, are uh, basically dissociated from. Mm. And what uh, is experienced is, you know, pretty much from the eyebrows up, mm -hmm. if you will. Whereas the body is this incredible uh, mechanism, not only of receiving uh, sensory input from the environment, but also um, it actually uh, teaches us things that are at the pre-conscious level, if we can access, um, makes clear to us that we're, for example, in danger, uh, there's attraction, there's resonance, or you know, whatever suite of possible uh, responses there can be based on um, what's happening in the body, even the toes curling up, knowing that mm. when your toes begin to grip, uh, that's telling you something. And so, you know, if you're just operating out of ideas um, only, uh, out of calculation, all of this more subtle content of responsiveness that is telling you what is happening in your subjective and lived experience is uh, not available to you. So being able to track your somatic experience, um, we feel, is really important, in part to uh, have access to this treasure trove of information, but um, also in part to uh, mitigate the possibility of uh, being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Which goes towards burnout, which is of right. course so common in healthcare workers. And I mean, I'm thinking now in the pandemic we've been experiencing the last year or two now, um, seems even more so, is in all of your work with um, the training of healthcare workers, you mentioned the ways that, you know, you kind of are taught to dissociate from your bodily signals and not attend to your basic biological needs. But is it also an almost intentional cut off in terms of um, how they're taught to relate to suffering? That's a very good point, Wendy, um, that dissociating and objectifying you know, dissociating yourself uh, from suffering, the truth of suffering, your witness, and then objectifying that suffering can mitigate overwhelm. And one is always looking for this sweet spot between over-identification, um, where there is psychosomatic overwhelm, and objectification, where uh, there is the ground for unethical uh, behavior, mm. basically, or mm. uh, a longer term sense of uh, moral injury because you just, um, you objectified and didn't realize that is a human being before me. Mm. So um, yeah, I think that a couple of things, you know, one, uh, we really got out of the work from Nancy Eisenberg and Daniel Batson, uh, that um, being able to uh, both be in resonance with the truth of suffering uh, in, in one way, and in another way to have the insight, I'm also not that person. Mm -hmm. It's actually not happening to me. Even though your body may be responding in a resonant way. Yeah, but what that does is it provides the means for you to downregulate and not move into overwhelm. Right. And Batson and, and Eisberg both write, write about this in terms of empathic distress, empathic over arousal, moving to uh, empathic distress and, you know, moral outrage, mm -hmm. um, which is, can be a protective response, uh, freeze, and also just avoidance, abandoning mm -hmm. your patient, or mm -hmm. engaging in uh, selfish prosocial behaviors. <laughs> And so um, do you view compassion as um, a kind of antidote to this empathic burnout or overwhelm that can happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, from one point of view, um, this is kind of a crude way to put it, but it, compassion is a triple win. Mm. That um, those who receive compassion, and I'm speaking about uh, compassion 
uh, in a very specific way. And I can talk more about that if you wish. Yeah. But um, the benefits who receive people who receive compassion are uh, consequential. Um, those who experience it, we're discovering, thanks to the work primarily through the experience of Mathieu Ricard and uh, you know, himself subjecting himself to you know, many uh, tests, work that Antoine Lutz has done and Richie Davidson, uh, Tanya Singer, others, um, that the one who is compassionate has all kinds of very subtle but clear benefits. It not only makes you feel good because you don't feel morally compromised for having objectified right. or ignored uh, the presence of suffering, but that you know you've actually engaged in you know behaviors which are about benefiting others, and you can have the joy if it turns out well. If it doesn't, mm -hmm. so be it. So that's the second you know sort of uh, geography of benefit is that the one who's compassionate benefits. Then what is really so wonderful is those who witness compassion feel mm -hmm. morally elevated and want mm -hmm. to engage in compassionate acts themselves. So it's contagious. It is. Yeah. You said you had a you were speaking about a very specific view of compassion. Do you want to say more about that? Well, I learned about this uh, in part through hearing about the research Antoine Lutz and the UW team engaged in uh, with a group of Tibetan yogis, you know, advanced practitioners on the practice of what they called uh, non-referential compassion. And I was like, how can that be? What, you know, what is non-referential compassion? You need an object. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I began to do uh, research, and the uh, 14th century, very great Zen master, Muso Soseki, uh, from Japan, uh, articulated a view, which is in, uh, in the Vajrayana world as well, um, about these three different valences of compassion, the third being um, authentic compassion, mm. realized compassion. But those valences are, are, it's simple. It's compassion with an object. So, you know, your, your child, your in-group, your co-combatant, your medical team, your culture, your neighborhood, your race, you know, it's whatever your in-group is. And so there's a, a kind of bias toward uh, responding to the suffering of those in your in-group more than those who are not in your in-group, which mm -hmm. is not to say that many people aren't compassionate toward those not in their in-group, but it's not as common. The second valence of compassion is uh, compassion that is dharmically and ethically based. It's compassion that um, where one sees the absence of a separate self-identity and yet at the same time understands interconnectedness. So we just out of being a wise being, we want to uh, serve, and this has a strong ethical base. And the third valence is uh, what Antoine was, uh, in his research, uh, exploring, and that is this non-referential or universal compassion, compassion without an object. And Soseki articulates this clearly. He um, makes uh, the point that this is really what authentic compassion is. As Mathieu describes it, you're always at the ready. Mm. This is your view, your attitude. It's in your marrow. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not produced by a specific event in context. It's that you are embedded in the context at all times, and when suffering is present, you spontaneously arise to bring benefit to uh, the one who's suffering. Mm. I was just really fascinated uh, by that and realized uh, why His Holiness said that compassion is the radicalism of our time. I mean, it is truly the, the most uh, upstream uh, frame of reference, attitude, uh, embodied experience that uh, in our era, <laughs> but I would suggest in any era, is uh, essential for the well-being of all species and also for coming generations. Wow, 
I'm just thinking about you were contextualizing compassion and interdependence in the in the context of so many current crises that we face um, as a world, perhaps the greatest one being climate change. And I feel like you've spoken recently, drawing that view into the space of, of climate work. Um, do you want to share your perspective there? Well, I think, of course, this is uh, the issue, not only of our time, but in the recent past and for the coming generations. And I think that, um, you know, unless we do realize this non-referential compassion, that is a compassion that is uh, all embracing, if you will, um, it's going to be a tough go, so mm -hmm. to speak. And I think there's another thing, and this has to do with the ethics around climate change. And we're seeing that, you know, in the uh, testimonies that are being pulled out of uh, oil executives. <laughs> <laughs> this very day, mm -hmm. um, that uh, we have to create the conditions where we are not so self-centered, where we are not so blind to the distributed self, mm -hmm. which is our very atmosphere, all of the earth, the rivers, the oceans, where we're extracting ancient sunlight and critters from uh, the mantle of the earth to throw into the atmosphere. <laughs> and uh, the outcomes are just staggering, not just to contemplate, they're being lived mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So this view that Francisco and his colleagues articulated and that were uh, explored in the embodied mind of the inactive perspective um, if we do not understand the nature of Pratichu Samupada, of interconnectedness, uh, interdependence, and interpenetration, that we are not separate from any being or thing, and that there is a, a hypercausality that's uh, now vividly in our face in relation to the health of our planet and the decline of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of realizing this view, you know, I'm thinking we, especially in the West, we come from this lineage of individualism and separateness, right? That's just like baked into our mindsets. Do you have thoughts about, I don't know if there's specific practices or certainly just embedding yourself in these, the study of these systems, but how can we help people shift out of that sense of separateness? Well, I think that the, the uh, endeavors uh, being made by uh, people in education, uh, in politics, even in business, to create the opportunities for people to explore um, their own subjective experience, both in the narrow sense of what's going on in my mind, heart, and body, and you know this is this is big in the West where everybody's in psychotherapy, so they think they know what their feelings are about, but they don't broaden the inquiry to include mm -hmm. uh, the somatic dimension or the possibility for understanding these narratives are constructed, and so mm -hmm. forth. So you know these endeavors to train people to you know really uh, cultivate a, a, a generation of all ages. Uh, of individuals who are both wise and compassionate um, through having the opportunity to have a contemplative life, not necessarily in the sense of, say, Brother David or Thomas Merton, where you're, you, know, you have your cell or your, your wonderful little house, uh, hermit's hut, um, but uh, where you, know, you actually understand the value even of a pause in this moment an exhale, a dropping down, a looking deep, more deeply. So, you know, I, I feel that those endeavors are really important. I also feel that the voices of indigenous peoples and uh, their wisdom being brought forward where they have uh, managed or been in relationship to uh, these wild ecologies that have kept their lives intact until, of course, the, the smallpox blankets uh, arrived on the scene. Um, uh, 
those uh, these indigenous cultures have so much uh, wisdom to impart to us, and including tech, you know, actual practical approaches uh, to uh, maintaining balance, being part of the system that maintains balance in the natural world. So the natural world is in a process of mutuality with the human world. And then the voices of young people. I mean, I have to hand it to Greta Thunberg. She's got it. She's making yeah. it work. And I love it. I love the fact that she's young. I love the fact that she is mentally different. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that she's in a female body. Mm -hmm. And her voice, whether meeting the Pope or the Dalai Lama or Jane Fonda or some of the great bodhisattvas on the planet with us today. And also, you know, just bawling out the heads of state. Yeah. Of countries all over the world. And boy, do I agree. You know, we're in the middle yeah. of this big vote about the well-being of not only our planet, but our children in our own country in relation to the dispensation of resources to support a society that is really in trouble, mm -hmm. to dial it down, which will take a generation or two in terms of the rebound effects or the uh, cascade effects. We can do this. <laughs> will we do it? Yeah, that's the question. We have to do it. Will we do it? I wanted to talk a little bit, if you have time, you've done so much work with dying people um, over your life. And I think so many people, you know, in the context of COVID and everything we've experienced in the last several years, um, so many more people are facing death and, and dealing with death. And I'm just wondering if you have insights about the process of dying, what's the most important or the most important things to know in terms of being with dying people and, and helping that transition? Mm. Well, this is where I feel healthcare workers who have uh, training in uh, not only the uh, experience of uh, contemplation that is being able to be grounded, to remember really why they're there, to attune to their own subjectivity, to be in resonance with the experience of those whom they're bearing witness to, to have the insight to um, look deeply to see what will serve and then to engage. But, you know, I created this training process called Grace, and I've just mm. taken you through it. You know, uh, this I think is re really important. Um, in other words, having the internal means to respond and to understand those are uh, means that are actually, that can be nourished. The second thing has to do with what Norman Fisher's called the bodhisattva view. Um, and this is, you know, a, a view that is opened up by the qualities of heart, mind, and body. Um, that we uh, cultivate or are present for us as we uh, are met in the world and by the world. And that bodhisattva attitude is this uh, spontaneous response <laughs> coming from our marrow, unprescribed, not uh, volitional, to the, the truth of suffering that uh, we encounter. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we just begin to really feel, wh why am I here? I'm here not to get another automobile in my garage <laughs> or, you know, another zero in my bank account, um, but really, to, how can I benefit others? So it's deeply uh, moral and ethical perspective, but it, it's in the marrow. It's where you realize you're not separate from. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's that, landscape that makes it possible to um, be with dying people because you see 
we're all going to die. The truth of impermanence is so in your face. Mm. And you also know that this is a sacred time, no matter how chaotic or messy, how many uh, family conflicts there are, how much fear is in the room, uh, how much beauty is in the room, that this is a sacred time and maybe the most important experience of a person's life. It shouldn't be just soaked up uh, in the midst of um, fear. And maybe you are that uh, island that that person can psychically step onto to realize their own confidence and let it go. Mm. It, it's powerful work. And I think many people who have gone into the end of life care field have been drawn, um, you know, because they realize this is a sacred time. And this is an opportunity also to face the truth of one's own mortality, a thought that does not leave me ever. Mm. You just mentioned letting go, which, of course, I guess death is the ultimate act of letting go. And I'm thinking about all of the letting go that can happen in contemplative practice. And I'm wondering if that can be like a, a slow preparation almost. Do you find that? Yeah, I, I think that um, practice provides often a very powerful context for uh, learning that ultimately we're safe. Mm. I know it's crazy to say, and it reminds me of something Ram Dass said, you know, death is safe. Letting go is safe. And it's really a matter of um, how we develop uh, trust in what is. And it reminds me of a line from uh, Zen master Keizan, who was, came a little after Ehe Dogen in Japan. And he said, uh, do not find fault with the present. Mm. And, you know, he's, he basically was saying the present is safe. This is what's happening. This is the only reality that is. So it's pretty radical, mm. pretty brilliant view. This is what is. You know, a dying person, not dead yet, <laughs> so to speak. This is where we are. Well, you don't say that to a dying person, of course, but you live it mm. as you make that connection. Yeah, thank you. I guess just as we're starting to come to a close... I'm curious, with all of your involvement um, these many decades in the origination and development of contemplative science, your thoughts on, you know, where the field is now and I guess most importantly, where it should be going, or like what are the, the most important next steps for people to be looking at? You know, I don't think I can really answer that, Wendy, <laughs> uh, adequately. Uh, I also don't think, in a, in a funny way, uh, anybody knows, like it's hubris to, to say mm. uh, where we think it's going. Uh, we didn't know it would go this way. Yeah. Um, certain ways it's gone, it's not so good. Mm. Uh, the commodification of um, the processes, for example, or the misapprehension of uh, misunderstanding of why uh, we do these practices. And, you know, the, it's turning them into big businesses, uh, creating cult-like organizations. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. not everything is unicorns, rainbows, and butterflies. <laughs> you know, uh, I think what's important is that we do the best that we can within our limited capacity to um, stay self-honest and honest with each other as this field uh, unfolds in various uh, domains, whether it's politics or law or meditation booths in Amazon, <laughs> you know, of working the, the questions and not being afraid to say, you know, okay, let's look at this. Is this um, really gonna benefit in the long run? So I think we have to stay, you know, awake and sharp. <laughs> and, not be in the, the trance of, uh, of saying that uh, whether it's mindfulness practice or uh, the use of psychedelics and psychotherapy, you know, every stick is two ends. Mm. 
Mm. And that we keep compassion out front in all of these different fields so that the, quote, right use, the beneficial use of these technologies um, is engaged and, and not the, the uh, harm that can arise when these technologies or approaches are abused. You just mentioned psychedelics. That's another thing I was thinking to ask you about because you did a lot of work decades ago using psychedelics, I believe also with end-of-life care. And of course, there's such a kind of renaissance now with psychedelics being used again in therapy. Do you have specific thoughts or experiences on, on their use, the way they're being used now? Yeah, I feel like I'm one of the uh, elders of the field. Um, I married Stan Groff. We did the work with dying cancer patients and others. And uh, that work, I feel, which is reflected in a book we did called The Human Encounter with Death, I think that came out in the mid-70s, um, which is now uh, kind of classic in the field, reflected um, our research in using LSD as an adjunct to psychotherapy. We had a very specific approach. Uh, Stan, of course, had a very intensive uh, exploration of these states, uh, not with dying people, but with artists and philosophers in Czechoslovakia. And he ended up developing you know, a perspective which was very interesting, which had a transpersonal dimension related to basic perinatal matrices and you know, the reliving of one's biological birth the effects of what he called coex systems, uh, systems of condensed experiences that we sort of repeat these patterns throughout our lives from maybe even conception through our birth and et cetera. And um, so this work was really uh, powerful. And what, what we discovered, you know, with intensive preparation, the day of the trip, and then uh, very intensive integration, not only with the dying person, but with their family or friends or spouses and so on, um, that people benefited deeply. And we had very specific, you know, double blind study. We had very specific mm -hmm. criteria to evaluate, including pain perception, ease of medical management, and all kinds of, you know, how you have to do this stuff. Anyway, uh, outcomes were great. And then uh, that work, you know, uh, part of our team um, was Bill Richards who then took that work out of the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center in the 70s, moved over to the East Bay campus of Johns Hopkins, and uh, continues to this day, which I think is just so fantastic, um, uh, working in collaboration with Roland Fisher and other people on that uh, East right. Bay team, and others uh, in the, around the world, including in Switzerland and other places, and in this country as well, using um, psychedelic psilocybin or other uh, hallucinogens as a way to take individuals through a very contemporary and powerful rite of passage where, you know, you see that we've underestimated the human mind seriously mm -hmm. uh, when the gates, if you will, the defenses are dropped and uh, there's you know, this profound activation that often leads to overwhelm and then this uh, kind of uh, mystical experience or old memories being evoked. And this is a whole, you know, it's a whole world. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty, I think it's very interesting. And, you know, I always say, just like a meditation, every stick has two ends. Uh, you know, it can be commodified. <laughs> It can be abused. Uh, people can get in trouble meditating and they can get in trouble on psychedelics. You know, you're, you mess with the mind, it can get messy, but it also has enormous uh, potential for positive transformation. Well, thank you. This has been so wonderful. Is there anything that you want to share that we haven't touched on, or do you have any final take-home thoughts for the audience? I just feel a lot of gratitude for uh, you, Wendy, and thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about uh, these various situations we find ourselves in, I, as I think we both agree, the upstream from our environmental crisis is obvious to many of us. Maybe upstream of that isn't, but um, I, I feel that this is a time where uh, really uh, cultivating 
these qualities of uh, wisdom and compassion are essential for the survival of all species and our planet. Mm, amen. Well, thank you so much, Roshi. I'm really grateful to you. Um, personally, you've been a great teacher to me and just for all that you've given to this field and to this world. And um, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Wendy. This season of Mind and Life is supported by the Academy for the Love of Learning, dedicated to awakening the natural love of learning in people of all ages. Episodes are edited and produced by me and Phil Walker, and music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. And if something in this conversation sparked insight for you, let us know. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. If you value these conversations, please consider supporting the show. You can make a donation at mindandlife.org under support. Any amount is so appreciated, and it really helps us create this show. Thank you for listening.